Each week, American History TV sits in on a lecture with one of the nation's college professors. You can watch the classes here every Saturday evening at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern. Next, East Carolina University Professor Emeritus Charles Calhoun talks about the obstacles faced by Ulysses S. Grant during his presidency and what he accomplished. He describes how Grant's military background and personality influenced a variety of the decisions he made during his two terms in office. Professor Calhoun was a guest lecturer at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. This is about 90 minutes. Good afternoon, and thanks for coming out to today's uh, lecture uh, in the U.S. Grant elective here at the Naval War College. Uh, it's my esteemed honor and privilege today to introduce to you Professor uh, Charles Calhoun, uh, Professor Emeritus from the uh, East Carolina University, today to talk on Grant's presidency. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to him at this time and uh, hold all your questions till the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colonel Borg, and thank you all for being here today. I'd like also to thank uh, Professor John Scott Logel, who could not be here today. He's in Hawaii, uh, missing the snow here in Rhode Island, but uh, uh, I know he did a lot of the background work on this as well. Uh, as uh, Professor Borg indicated, I'm going to be talking today about the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, his, his leadership in the White House. And I have a couple of caveats to share with you before I begin the, the meat of the talk, and that is, first of all, uh, I am a political historian, not a military historian. So I imagine that most of you in this room know infinitely more about Grant's military career, particularly after taking this course, uh, than I do. Uh, my specialty as an historian is late 19th century American politics. And uh, the second caveat relates to the fact that I am uh, writing a book on the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant for uh, the University Press of Kansas. And it is still very much a, a work in progress uh, I haven't figured out everything about this man in the White House. Perhaps that is an impossibility. But um, so some of the things I'll be saying today are uh, tentative in nature, shall we say. Um, we don't have time today to go through an entire uh, chronology of the events in Grant's very busy two terms in the White House. Instead, what I'd like to do today is to raise a few points about how to look at the Grant presidency. First, to say something about historiography, that is, how has he been treated in the past? I'll be very brief about that. Then take a look at some of the problems confronting the country when he became president, and some of them endured during his presidency. Uh, then I'd like to discuss with you a, a bit about some of the assets that he brought to the office of president that uh, helped him succeed, not only personal assets, but also some that were embedded in the culture uh, in which he was operating. And the flip side of that, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the liabilities that he confronted, both personal and contextual as well. Um, then say a few words about Grant's achievements in the White House, and then uh, a, a little bit about his impact on the evolution of the office of president. First of all, historiography. Grant has had a fairly bad press uh, as president uh, ever since he was in the White House. Uh, and the view uh, really started even before he took office. The standard view was that uh, he performed badly and then reformers criticized him. And the truth of the matter is that there were some people who were ready to criticize him even before he became president. I could name names here. One is Charles Sumner, who may have been disappointed that he wasn't appointed Secretary of State. He became a very severe critic of Grant throughout his presidency, well, until he died in 1874. Um, he was uh, always uh, uh, criticizing Grant for things that uh, he thought were not being handled properly. Another critic was Henry Adams. Uh, he was turned off by the Johnson administration, and even before Grant became president, he had vowed to write articles exposing corruption in the government. So he was, he was ready for bear even before uh, Ulysses S. Grant put his hand on the Bible on March 4, 1869, to become president. Uh, and throughout his term, uh, Henry Adams uh, wrote uh, quite critical articles about him. And then if you've ever read The Education of Henry Adams, you know that Grant comes off there uh, very badly as well. These men thought that Grant was a liar, that he was vulgar, that he was low in his instincts, that he was stupid, that he was conniving. Uh, very nasty portrait of Grant in the White House. Um, he also suffered, I would say, the president did, uh, from uh, the partisan journalism of the time, and, and that's, that's par for the courses for a president, but it was quite severe in Grant's time. 
uh, and uh, some of the newspapers, particularly Democratic newspapers, gave him a very hard time. And uh, uh, congressional investigations, again, once the Democrats got control of the House of Representatives, uh, uh, severely um, uh, investigated and, and criticized uh, Grant's performance. The, the significance of all this is that these critics' comments and, and uh, notions about Grant uh, became embedded in the literature, the historical literature, of most of the 20th century. Historians doing their work uh, in the first 75 or so years of the 20th century began, to, when they looked back at the Grant administration, they tended to pay a lot more attention to what his enemies said about him than really about what he had accomplished in the White House. If you look at the presidential polls uh, that were conducted the beginning in 1948 by Arthur Schlesinger Sr. These were polls conducted among historians and political scientists, journalists, uh, and others. Uh, you see that Grant tended to rank uh, quite low in those polls, never rock bottom. That was usually reserved for Andrew Johnson or James Buchanan, but still nonetheless quite low, um, reflecting the, 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 the scholarly image of, of Grant over the years, the scholarly uh, criticism of him. But about 25, 30 years ago, there began to be something of a rehabilitation of the uh, scholarship uh, on Grant, uh, Grant's reputation in the scholarship. Um, and that was due largely, I think, to the civil rights movement, the developments in civil rights in the 20th century. Grant came to be seen in many um, historians' views and others' views as, as a defender of civil rights, and uh, hence his estimate uh, has tended to rise ever since that time. And again, if you look at those presidential uh, assessment polls, if you will, you can see Grant in the latter ones uh, ranking uh, somewhere in the middle, never, never into the top five or even the top ten, but certainly uh, doing much better than he had when those polls were first beginning around the middle of the 20th century. Uh, so uh, Grant uh, has had a, 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 an evolving uh, impression or, or uh, reputation, shall we say, uh, uh, among historians and other scholars. What kind of problems did Grant face when he uh, became president? The most significant domestic problem, of course, was the question of Reconstruction, what to do about the South and what to do about race relations in the South. Grant liked to refer to this problem as uh, the efforts to secure the results of the war. Uh, and this was a question of enormous difficulty, not only because of the problems in the South, but also because um, the approach to Reconstruction in the immediate post-war years uh, was a subject of great wrangling between the President, Andrew Johnson, and the Republican Party in Congress. And one way of looking at Reconstruction is not only uh, dealing with what's happening in the South, but also um, looking at this as an institutional struggle between the president and the Congress. And so one of the tasks Grant confronted was not only trying to uh, fortify uh, Reconstruction efforts in the South to uphold the rights of the former slaves and so forth, but also to try to rebalance and recalibrate the relations with, um, the, with the Congress. And, and that was a very tall order. Another problem that resulted from the Civil War related to the nation's finances. Uh, during the Civil War, the United States government, of course, uh, needed to raise very large sums of money, and it, and it uh, passed a, uh, a tremendous new load of taxes. Uh, tariffs were raised, internal taxes were raised, excise taxes, uh, an income tax was instituted, inheritance taxes, and on and on. The federal government taxed just about anything that moved during the Civil War. Still wasn't enough to cover the cost of the war, so the um, government also engaged in heavy borrowing, uh, selling bonds, and so the national debt was something like $2 billion at the end of the war, which seems like chicken feed to us today, but it was an enormous sum of money uh, at that time. And the question was, what kind of program could the government put in place to, to begin to pay that back? Borrowing wasn't even enough either. The government also got into the business of simply printing money, the so-called greenbacks, unbacked by gold or silver. And the question remained in the post-war years, well, what are we going to do with that money? Are we going to try to get it back to a situation where we would pay gold and silver for it? So the whole specie resumption question was there. So there are lots of financial issues related to the war that Grant would confront in the White House. There were problems on the frontier, of course, with Native Americans, the Indians. Uh, and this, this was as old as the country. There was nothing new in Grant's era. 
Um, in Grant's time, uh, the mistreatment of the Indians was, was continuing. You had the clashes between white settlers moving westward uh, and Indians clinging to their traditional ways. And um, this was something that Grant felt very deeply about and was one of the major problems that he tried to deal with as president. Well, in dealing with those problems, I submit that Grant did have available to him a certain uh, group of assets that he could bring to bear. Some of them were personal to himself. Others, I think, were more institutional or, or contextual, if you will. We'll, took a, we'll take a look at the personal ones first. Um, first of all, Grant had experience as an administrator, and that came from his war uh, years. Not only the Civil War, but also in the Mexican War. In the Mexican War, he was in the Quartermaster uh, Corps and uh, learned how to organize um, in that situation, learned how to learn the value of supply lines and, and so forth. And, and this was important. He, he honed his organizational skills in that role. But of course, the most important experience that he had was in his commands during the Civil War. He, uh, those commands became ever and ever larger until, of course, in the last year or so, he was in, head of all the Union armies. And this is very important experience for him to carry into the White House because it lear he learned how to run a huge organization he learned how to see the big picture. He learned how to delegate tasks to achieve his goals. Um, when he was running for president in 1868, the Chicago Tribune pro Grant ran an editorial and compared him to other candidates who had, say, legislative uh, experience in the Congress or judicial experience in uh, there were a couple of Supreme Court justices people were thinking about uh, for president. And they said Grant was superior to them because uh, of his military experience. And the reason for that was that his military experience was primarily executive, not judicial, not, judici uh, not legislative, but executive, and that that's what was needed uh, in, the, in the White House. Um, so that was an important asset for him. He also had a great sense of determination to see things through to a successful conclusion. And this is something that was with him all his life. If you've had a chance to read his memoirs, you see that he, he states that he never liked retracing his steps. He never liked going backward. Um, he always wanted to move forward toward his goal, and he would try to find alternative routes to get there if necessary, but that was, that was his determination. And you can see that perhaps during the war years, most clearly in the Vicksburg campaign. During the war, Grant also showed that he could be a great judge of men. He could assess men's strengths. Uh, he could assess their weaknesses. Um, this was his reputation during the war, and it was borne out largely by experiences uh, with uh, great lieutenants such as Sherman and Sheridan and McPherson and, and so forth. There's some question about how well he translated that into uh, civilian life. Uh, it took him some time, I think, to do that. Um, he did it, I think, primarily when he realized that the Republican Party uh, in his time, during his term, was sort of the army that he was now commanding. And his lieutenants were not only some of his people in, in the cabinet, but also uh, some key figures in the Congress, such as Roscoe Conkling and Oliver Morton. These were, these were important senators who helped Grant uh, achieve his goals, doing the same kind of thing that, say, a Sherman or a Sheridan did during the war to help him achieve his goals in, um, in wartime. Grant also in a little more abstract sense, had a great commitment to the fundamental democratic ideals of the United States. He was a quite a dedicated uh, patriot. He wanted uh, the Union Army to succeed. He wanted his country to succeed in the post-war years. And uh, his, his commitment to democratic ideals, uh, initially before the war, he wasn't much interested in politics, had a suspicion of politicians after the war uh, when he was in the White House. He did come to realize that the, the, the great potential for positive good through political action. And he did uh, very much uh, uphold the rights of the former slaves uh, to vote, black suffrage. So that, that very much connected with his sense of democratic ideals uh, as, part of the, uh, as part of the American credo. And uh, he believed it was uh, a very important part of his responsibility to uphold the new amendments to the Constitution that uh, undergooded undergirded civil rights and the, and the right to vote. What we have to remember about Ulysses S. Grant is that he did not undergo a lobotomy between Appomattox and the first inauguration as president in 1869. 
As a general, he had exhibited a profound capacity to envision both the totality of things and the details of things, uh, of operations. He manipulated his subordinates well, and he, and he showed a dogged perseverance to, to achieve his goals, uh, often against heavily, heavy odds. And I would submit that these traits did not abandon him when he went into the White House, but I think it's fair to say that it took him a little time to adjust them uh, to peacetime usages. All right, those are his personal assets, uh, some of them, I think. That the list could probably go on. What about institutional assets or external assets that, that could aid him in his operations as president? Well, I think one of the things that was working for him was a wealth of goodwill in the country at large. He went into the presidency uh, respected generally. Uh, of course, he was the savior of the Union, after all. And after the death of Lincoln, he was, he was the most revered man in the United States, uh, and certainly in the North. And in the South, he was, he was respected by many people, um, not only for his treatment of Lee, but also for his, uh, at, at Appomattox, but his protection of Lee and other officers from, from trial, and his, and his sense that it would be good to get the country back together as soon as possible. Um, so that, that was an important part of his, uh, his, his milieu that, that, that worked to his advantage. A great uh, um, uh, atmosphere of goodwill when he, when he took the oath of office. Also working to his advantage was uh, uh, Republican, majority, Republican majorities in both houses of Congress, very large majorities as a matter of fact. Uh, his party controlled both houses of Congress for the first six years of his presidency in the last two years the Democrats had the House of Representatives. This was important because obviously it eased uh, Grant's legislative task and he could get things done uh, uh, a little bit more easily than uh, would be otherwise the case, as we well know. Um, uh, presidents who have divided government uh, do have difficulties. Another asset that this president had and most presidents of the 19th century took advantage of was the patronage power. That is to say, uh, the appointments to office of subordinates uh, uh, around the country, uh, not only in the positions in Washington, but in, in federal offices around the country. And it was important because he, like other presidents, would take the advice of senators and representatives uh, about whom to appoint to those positions. And that patronage power helped Grant forge alliances with those key leaders that I was talking about earlier in the Congress uh, and uh, uh, strengthened his ability to get uh, through Congress what he wanted to. So on the, on the plus ledger, there were a number of things working to Grant's uh, advantage, uh, both in his personal makeup, his personal experiences, and in the institutional setting in which he, he uh, conducted the White House. But on the other side of the ledger, there were liabilities, there were obstacles to his success, factors that worked against him. And uh, once again, I think we can divide them into personal deficiencies and uh, institutional or contextual ones. Um, I think it's worth noting that, indeed, despite his military experience, and that was executive experience, he did lack uh, political knowledge, he did lack some political experience uh, because he, he had never held a political office before. He was in Washington between 1865 and 1869 uh, as, as general in chief of the army and very briefly as, as ad interim secretary of war. And in that, the, in that time, he, he learned a great deal about how Washington worked. Uh, but he was still somewhat naive when he, when he took the oath of office in the feeling that he could somehow remain above politics. He could remain above the fray. Uh, it, it, it wasn't going to work out that way. Uh, as, he, as he actually rather quickly realized that, uh, as I was saying earlier, he would need to forge those, those positive relationships with leaders in the Congress. Another element that I, in his personal makeup that I think perhaps worked against success to some degree was his taciturnity. That is, uh, his, his, he was known as the great silent man. He didn't like public speaking. He seldom spoke as president other than just to acknowledge the greetings of a crowd. And this was unfortunate because I think Grant missed the opportunity to use the presidency as a bully pulpit for the, th the things that he believed in and that he favored. Um, 
Why was he this way? Well, I think there was something about his personal makeup that, that made him averse to public speaking, but also it was a reaction to Andrew Johnson, who Grant believed uh, had made a fool of himself uh, during uh, several of his speaking tours. Um, Grant accompanied him on one in 1866, in which Andrew Johnson really got into sort of shouting matches with, with uh, people in the crowds and, and really sort of brought the presidency low. And, and Grant's idea was, not for me. I'm not, I'm not going to do that kind of thing. Um, could he speak effectively? Yes, on occasion he did. In 1875, he made a speech that was, that was used quite effectively in the Ohio uh, gubernatorial campaign that got Rutherford B. Hayes reelected the governor of Ohio that, Ohio that year and positioned him to run for president the, the following year. But um, in a sense, that's the exception that proves the rule on Grant uh, about public speaking. It's too bad that he didn't do more of it. Uh, when, he went across, when he went abroad uh, after his presidency, he discovered he actually was a pretty good speaker and, and came to enjoy it, but not during the White House. Grant was an excellent writer, however, and he did use his messages to Congress, both special messages and his annual message, uh, to uh, propose policies, to defend his positions, and, and so forth. And he could be quite eloquent on occasion in doing that, particularly uh, in, uh, in messages that related to civil rights uh, questions. Grant, like all presidents of the 19th century, did not go to Congress in person. It wasn't done. It wouldn't be done again until uh, Thomas Jefferson stopped that, that uh, and, and Woodrow Wilson picked it up. So most of the 19th century, presidents simply sent their word to Congress on paper. And, uh, Grant could do this effectively, but, but he, he could have done more of it, I think, uh, and, and been more effective. Uh, there was some use of the press in the Grant presidency, um, favorable, feeding favorable information to reporters. Grant sometimes gave interviews to uh, the New York Herald, for instance. But by and large, and this is, this is really the, the core of this point, I think that one of the the contextual problems that Grant confronted uh, uh, are, and related to his personal problem was that his taciturnity was that uh, he didn't control the narrative. He did not control the narrative. And what happened was that his enemies, his adversaries, did tend to control that narrative. And when it came time for historians of the 20th century to look back and write about the Grant administration, they tended to, to pay attention to um, those adversaries' points uh, much more than, than what the president and his advocates uh, were saying. Another personal deficiency that I think worked against Grant was what we might term uh, an excessive loyalty to people around him, loyalty to a fault, really, uh, with many of his associates. Grant was a highly sensitive man. He was an appreciative man. He, he held friendships dearly. Um, he stood by those who stood by him. Uh, but sometimes he would remain loyal to people beyond the time when, when his loyal, they were worth his loyalty, and, um, and that was unfortunate. His own son, Ulysses S. Grant Jr., once said of his father, he's, he's incapable of supposing his friends to be selfish. And the simple fact of the matter is some of them were selfish, and Grant may have had too trusting a, a relationship with some of them. And that opened him to charges of uh, countenancing or winking at corruption. And, that, and that's, uh, of course, the most enduring condemnation of, of the Grant administration in many ways. Part of the reason I think that Grant did cling so tenaciously to proven friends was uh, his own sense of, believe it or not, inferiority. I think Grant, uh, we, we don't have the option of putting Grant on the couch, but it's inevitable that we try to analyze his personality. And I think there was an element of an inferiority complex in some contexts uh, with Ulysses S. Grant. He did greatly admire men of wealth. And because they, they compared so favorably to his own early failures in business, and he thought that these men had um, a deep understanding of the American economy, and perhaps he was a little too willing to listen to their advice uh, regarding economic policy uh, in the White House. And um, Grant also had, I believe, a sense of inferiority uh, with uh, what, we, what we, people we might term intellectuals. Uh, Grant was a man of simple tastes. He enjoyed his family life very much, not particularly interested in cultural matters. 
Um, there's some evidence that he may have felt that his West Point kind of basic engineering education was somehow inferior to the classical education that men received at, at Yale and Harvard and such places. So Grant had some trouble reaching out to those men, um, and, and he tended to avoid their company and hence to avoid their counsel. Um, and I say this is an inferiority complex, but in fact, uh, the uh, Grant may have been right about the way these people felt about him. Um, they did tend to look down on him, as a matter of fact. They, as I was saying earlier, they thought he was ignorant. They thought he was base and vulgar and ill-mannered. Uh, Henry Adams' wife once referred to Ulysses S. Grant as the king of vulgaria. And, uh, you know, this, this kind of image stuck, unfortunately. Grant was a highly intelligent man. Just read his memoirs, and that's uh, uh, more than abundantly clear. But he did lack the kind of self-confidence that an Abraham Lincoln had who could sort of scoff and blow off people who, who uh, criticized his background. He, he, of course, laughed at his own background. Uh, and Grant had that trouble uh, reaching out to intellectual leaders. The question of vulgarity leads us to um, the, uh, the rumors about Grant's drinking. I won't spend a lot of time on this question. Uh, most of it stems from his war years, um, uh, uh, highly exaggerated, I think. Grant did drink in the White House. Uh, he served alcohol at receptions and meals. Uh, he did not drink to excess in the White House. An article came out about uh, 1983 alleging that Grant was an alcoholic, that, uh, that uh, he didn't need to drink to function, which certainly was the case. He did not drink to function, but that he would occasionally go on, on binges. I, I think that that's probably... Uh, misses the mark. Um, I think the real, if you, we, we, again, we don't have Grant's medical chart in front of us, but if we did, I think what we'd see that Grant had a very low tolerance for alcohol, uh, a thimble belly, if you will, and so very little alcohol would have uh, an effect on him, and that might appear to be a binge, but it's not really the, the case. And I think it's important to put the drinking charge into a wider context uh, of, of his time. Mid-19th century witnessed a, a real upsurge in sensitivity to the evils of drink. This is the time when the temperance movement is, is very strong. This is the time when the WCTU was created. This is the time when the Prohibition Party came into being. And so there was this, this, this uh, cultural sensitivity against alcohol that gave Grant's enemies a convenient weapon to use against him. The rumors from the war, they could blow up into... into uh, a real charge against him. Um, and, and that's important. Uh, what's, what's important here is not that Grant may have had a couple of drinks in the White House, he certainly did on occasion, but what's important is that these murmurings about uh, his habits, uh, I shouldn't even use the term habits, about his occasional drinking, uh, uh, whatever the reality was, uh, that those murmurings, I would submit, diminished his reputation and uh, to some degree that did diminish his, uh, undermined his, his effectiveness as president. So there, there are a number of, of uh, personality, I, don't, I hate to use the word deficiencies, but on the negative side of the scale, some things about Grant's personal makeup that, that worked against him as president. Uh, but there are also institutional problems and obstacles that worked against his success in the White House. For one, Grant was highly unlucky in his predecessor. Andrew Johnson had really dealt the presidency a devastating blow uh, with his overbearing manner, with his, with his fights with Congress. Uh, he poisoned relationships between the Congress and the presidency. And what happened was that many congressional leaders became wedded to the idea that, that the president, whoever was sitting there, needed to be hemmed in. We don't want another man like Andrew Johnson. Uh, and, and so there was this lingering uh, skepticism about the president exerting too much influence uh, over policy questions in the Congress. Grant himself recognized this in, in his inaugural address. The very first speech he made in the White House, or at the time he entered the White House, was he said one sentence, I shall on all subjects have a policy to recommend, but none to enforce against the will of the people. This was a direct reaction to, to Johnson's poor relations with the Congress. It was a calculated sentence to try to put the Congress uh, on ease about, about his 
how he was going to deal with them. Uh, but it was a huge task he confronted to try to um, make those relationships more amicable. That task was made more difficult by the fact that his own party in the Congress was riven by faction. Yes, they had large majorities, but they were also split in many ways, the Republicans. Reconstruction policy, we saw the Republicans split over between radicals and moderates. Over the tariff issue between protectionists and free traders. Over the money issue between hard money men and inflationists. Uh, on patronage questions between uh, regular politicians and civil service reformers. So these divisions were important, uh, made, made uh, uh, operating with the Congress a little bit more difficult. And they were so significant, those divisions, that a chunk of the party split off in uh, 1872 and formed what was known as the Liberal Republican Party to try to uh, uh, get Grant out of the White House uh, by nominating Horace Greeley. Another obstacle, this was a, one focused on the question of Reconstruction, and that was the intractability of Southern whites. The degree to which Grant failed to achieve real change in the South, I would submit, reflected the absolute determination of Southern whites to regain control, to regain political control and to keep it. No president, I think, not even Lincoln, could have won acceptance of political equality between blacks and whites in the South at that particular moment. And uh, there's evidence today that uh, the problem lingers to some degree. Whites after the Civil War, the dominant whites after the Civil War in the South, were determined that this was going to be a white man's government. And um, uh, it, was, it was very difficult to counteract that. Another kind of contextual problem that Grant confronted was almost endless uh, uh, assaults by his enemies, nonstop, really. Uh, as noted above, I talked about Sumner and Adams. Um, these were men who were determined to bring Grant down from the very beginning, even before he took office. He was under a constant barrage of criticism. Um, some of it was selfishly motivated. Some of these people were people, uh, were disappointed office seekers who thought they deserved appointments from Grant and didn't get them. Um, but uh, those enemies would reach for just about any kind of criticism they, they could against Grant, and one of them was, was corruption. They charged corruption in the administration. And so another problem that Grant confronted during his presidency was the United States at that time was kind of experiencing a culture of corruption and a, and a sensitivity to corruption that tended to undermine his, his power in the White House. There was a belief at this time that the government was riddled with corruption. And that wasn't, that wasn't particularly new. It at least extended back into the Civil War years. We know that there were, there were people on the take during the Civil War and manipulating contracts and so forth and so on. Uh, this continued into the Johnson years. Uh, and in fact, in the 1868 campaign, the Republicans run, uh, running that year said, put us in power and we'll get rid of the, the corruption that Andrew Johnson has sponsored. Uh, and uh, so um, what we have to remember is that Ulysses S. Grant inherited a culture of corruption when he entered the presidency. He didn't create it. Um, you have to remember the context. This was a post-war period. And very often in a post-war period, uh, we see ethical considerations sort of take a back seat, as it were. During, during wartime, you have a great time of self-sacrifice and self-denial. It's not unusual for that to give way to uh, self-indulgence, if you will, and self-serving. So that um, another example would be World War I giving way to the Roaring Twenties and the, and the Harding era. So in the, in the post-Civil War period, you had Boss Tweed in New York, other city machines. You had corruption in some of the Reconstruction governments in the South. Uh, you had some malfeasance in the Congress itself. In fact, some of the, the allegations of corruption in this period that are are focused on Grant are actually things that happened in the Congress, like the so-called salary grab and the, and the credit mobilier. Um, I don't mean to say that there was no corruption in the Grant administration. That would not be true. There was some. I think it's been exaggerated, but a couple of examples I'll, I'll lay on the table. Secretary of War William Belknap in 1876 was caught out taking bribes to um, uh, to appoint certain men to what were called post-traderships in the forts out in the West. 
uh, men who would run what today we might call the PX at these, at these uh, forts, um, and he was forced to resign. Uh, the whiskey ring was probably the most important uh, instance of corruption during the Grant administration, uh, during the time, he, and it, that too, by the way, started before he became president, and it was his Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, who, who attacked it uh, and, and brought it down. But this was, this was a, a, a conspiracy between uh, distillers of whiskey and uh, officials in the Internal Revenue Service to basically avoid federal taxes. Um, it, it touched Grant in the sense that uh, one of his secretaries, Orville Babcock, uh, was thought to be involved. And the Secretary of the Treasury, Bristow, indeed brought Babcock to trial. Uh, and I think the, the evidence against him was, was pretty significant. It was, it was circumstantial, but it was, it was pretty uh, conv convincing, I think, although he was acquitted. And when he was tried in St. Louis, this was in 1876, Grant volunteered to go testify on Orville Babcock's behalf. He didn't go. His saner heads in the White House, or cooler heads in the White House, I guess I should say, said that uh, you know, for you to go out there would not be, uh, and you know, sit in the witness box would not be uh, a good thing for the presidency. But he did give a deposition before the Chief Justice of the United States in favor of his, his friend and aide, Orville Babcock, and Babcock was acquitted. You might ask, why would he do that? If, if the evidence seems so, stat, so clearly um, that Babcock probably was, was involved. And I think probably we could say that this is after seven years in the White House. Uh, Grant saw the, the attack on the, the trial of Babcock, if you will, as an attack on himself personally. And after seven years, six, six or seven years of this continued criticism coming from his enemies, uh, I think by that time he had developed a kind of circle the wagons mentality and, um, and decided uh, to give the deposition. Uh, some other points about corruption that we might take note of. Hamilton Fish, his upright Secretary of State, may have had some inklings about some, some shady dealings going on in parts of the administration, but I can find no evidence that he ever gave a, a kind of... Uh, cancer on the presidency speech that, say, John Dean gave to Richard Nixon. Uh, in fact, Hamilton Fish supported Grant for president in 1880 when he, when he tried to get the nomination again that year. Um, another point about, uh, about corruption, the patronage power, uh, the power to appoint people to office. Civil service reformers tended to equate that with a kind of corruption. And the simple fact of the matter was it was the inherited personnel system of the federal government at that time. And it, many presidents had used it over the years. And uh, if you've seen the movie Lincoln, you can see Abraham Lincoln using it effectively to round up support for the 13th Amendment to pass uh, uh, the Congress. So, uh, but again, it became a handle to use against uh, Grant in particular. Expenditures, another thing. Uh, fiscal conservatives tended to label label any kind of uh, expenditures practically as corrupt. Um, they, they called them raids on the treasury. Expenditure became, in some people's minds, equivalent to extravagance, which became equivalent to corruption. And uh, uh, this was unfortunate because at a time when the economy was changing, when the government's role in the economy was changing, this kind of easy, easy research course to the word corruption to describe expenditures uh, of perhaps an unusual nature or an increased nature uh, tended to undermine having a real conversation about what the government's role ought to be. And, and, it, and it, was, it was stifling, I think, uh, to, the, to the government to do that. Um, but the point, important point for us here today is that Grant's political enemies found the charge of corruption as a as a uh, ready tool to demonize him in the White House. Uh, and uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of them were simply using it to get back at him uh, for besting them in, in politics. They would use highly charged language, vulgarity, thievery, uh, brutality, Caesarism. Uh, and I think, I think what is important to remember is that, is that we're always going to have corruption in government. What may change is our sensitivity to corruption. Uh, the historian Mark Summers uh, has done a good job of describing uh, this, this dichotomy. 
And um, the overall take, I think, is that um, that charge was seized by, by Grant's um, enemies, and it tended to undermine his effectiveness as president and certainly tended to besmirch his historical reputation. Well, did he achieve anything? I think he did. Despite, despite these obstacles that he had to overcome, I think there were some important achievements. But we have to, I think, also say it was something of a mixed record, in part because of some of these obstacles that turned out to be insurmountable. In the area of Reconstruction, when Grant uh, gave his inaugural address, uh, he called for the ratification of the 15th Amendment, uh, conferring the, uh, the right to vote on the former slaves, male former slaves. And um, he, during his uh, first year in office, he pushed for its ratification, pushed state legislatures to, to, to put it actually finally on the books, and that was achieved in 1870. Um, it was not self-actuating, however. It would need uh, legislation to, to undergird it and, and put it into effective operation. And so we, we also see Grant uh, favoring uh, enforcement legislation. 1870-71, uh, the Congress uh, passed several laws that would protect uh, rights under the 14th and the 15th Amendments. Grant would use troops on occasion, most notably in South Carolina in the fall of 1871 to put down the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he backed the Civil Rights Act of 1875 uh, and, and it did pass. This was a public accommodations bill, and it was certainly very modern in its, in its intent uh, and uh, uh, basically uh, mandating uh, equality of treatment in public accommodations. And Grant's urging this was passed, and um, uh, it became law. Unfortunately, eight years later in 1883, the Supreme Court of the United States declared it unconstitutional. Um, so... One thing to remember about Grant and Reconstruction, I think, is that he championed blacks' rights at increasing political risk. Uh, his enemies um, tended to, when they looked at him using troops in, in South Carolina, for instance, they jumped on that and said, oh, we're going to have a military dictatorship in this country. They accused Grant of militarism. And, and this was unfortunate because uh, it tended to get a lodgment in people's minds and the real purpose of using those troops uh, got lost in some people's minds. The bottom line for Reconstruction, alas, is that Northern public opinion uh, increasingly abandoned the project, if you will, uh, despite Grant's efforts to keep it alive. And in the South, as I was mentioning earlier, whites were determined that it would not succeed, and ultimately uh, uh, Reconstruction did come to um, an unsuccessful end uh, that lasted for nearly a century. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, after he was out of the White House in the late 1870s, Grant, speaking with a, uh, a reporter, once said that uh, perhaps he should have kept, we should have kept a military occupation of the South for 10 years uh, in order to ensure uh, the success of a true Reconstruction. Uh, but, of course, that did not happen and probably could not have happened. One area where he did achieve an, an unalloyed success was in the so-called Alabama claims. These were the claims that uh, uh, were uh, registered against, the United, uh, against Great Britain by the United States in the uh, uh, dealing with the um, uh, US CSS Alabama, the ship that uh, had been, there were a few of them, a handful of them, ships that had been built in Great Britain during the Civil War and uh, they went into the Confederate service and uh, served primarily as commerce raiders. And the United States, uh, commerce raiders uh, attacking northern merchant vessels on the high seas, and, and were quite successful at that. And the, uh, uh, the United States held Great Britain liable for that, held them uh, accountable for this, the uh, activities of those ships. And, uh, this was a this was a this was a problem uh, in our democratic uh, diplomatic relations with uh, with Great Britain after the war and uh, Grant and his Secretary of State Hamilton Fish did negotiate the so-called Treaty of Washington, setting up the Geneva arbitration uh, to uh, arbitrate those claims, and Great Britain paid uh, fifteen point five million dollars as a result of those um, of that arbitration. 
The treaty, but there was, there was, it was not just the money. It was not just the $15.5 million uh, that the arbitrators made Great Britain pay the United States. There was also a tr strategic vision involved in this. And, and Grant, um, the Treaty of Washington and the Geneva Accord gave a relatively narrow definition of the types of activity that a neutral country could be held accountable for uh, by a belligerent in time of war. And this was exactly what Grant was looking for. Grant believed that down the road, when, the United, when wars were going on, the United States would probably not be involved in them uh, primarily, and that, um, uh, generally speaking, and, and that uh, uh, as a neutral, we would want to be able to do as many things as possible, particularly in the area of trade. And the fact that uh, the Treaty of Washington and the Geneva Arbitration gave a relatively narrow definition of, on the restrictions of the restrictions of neutral uh, on neutrals during time of war worked precisely to uh, the United States' advantage, Grant believed. Another attempt uh, to fill a strategic vision was uh, Grant's attempt to annex Santo Domingo, what today we call the Dominican Republic. This was a, a nation in the Caribbean, half of the island of Hispaniola, the other half being Haiti. Um, the uh, <clears throat> had an unstable government, uh, revolving door governments, revolutions every other week practically. Even before Grant became president, its beleaguered president asked the United States to annex it. Grant didn't invent this idea of annexing uh, Santo Domingo, as was sometimes alleged. It's, it's another thing that he inherited. And um, uh, when he became president, they renewed their offer, as it were, and Grant investigated it. And once again, he brought to bear certain considerations of a strategic uh, nature in, in thinking about annexing Santo Domingo. One of the lessons he thought that the United States learned in the uh, uh, Civil War was the importance of controlling sea lanes uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And Great Britain at that time had a cordon of island uh, colonies and outposts in Central and, and, Latin and South America uh, that enabled the British Navy pretty much to control the Caribbean Sea so that the United States merchant vessels going from the east coast of the United States to the Gulf Coast would actually have to go what Grant referred to as foreign waters. So th he thought it was quite important for the United States to get a base in that region. Uh, Samana Bay in Santo Domingo seemed like the ideal spot uh, for a base that would, would help keep those sea lanes open to trade and, of course, uh, would serve a vital function during time of war, if necessary. Another strategic interest in that was, of course, everybody was thinking at this time and would continue for the next half century thinking about building a canal through Central America. This is before the Pan Panama Canal, of course, but everybody had this on their mind, and Grant thought, well, if we do have such a canal, we would want to be able to command a defensive position on the eastern terminus of that, and Santo Domingo, again, could serve that uh, that uh, very well. There were, there were Monroe Doctrine considerations. The, um, if the United States didn't take Santo Domingo, perhaps somebody else would. And there was some fear that maybe Germany was looking for a foothold in the Caribbean. Um, Grant also had in mind uh, considerations related to Santo Domingo's resources. It was a fertile country, sugar, coffee, chocolate, fruits, uh, large stands of timber. All of these things could come into the United States um, free of tariff charges if, if the United States were to acquire Santo Domingo. And, and Grant thought that that would be a great plus for both sides, both the United States and the people living in Santo Domingo. Also, there was a, re a reason related to Reconstruction, and that was this. Uh, everybody knew, Grant well knew, that, that blacks were being mistreated in the South, and perhaps uh, Santo Domingo whose population, by the way, was black or mixed race, uh, almost 100%, um, that this would serve as a kind of haven for American blacks who were looking for uh, a better life. And even if they didn't go there, uh, I don't mean to portray Grant as an ardent colonizer, that's not the point, but he also felt that, um, that the, the possibility of going there might be used by blacks in the South to leverage better treatment from from their former masters uh, in the South. So, so Frederick Douglass, for instance, was uh, a strong supporter of, of uh, annexation. 
so there were lots of reasons Grant believed that Santo Domingo was, was a, a real plus. It could be a, the crowning achievement of his first term and help him win a second. But it was not approved. Uh, he failed to get the annexation treaty approved. This is not to say that the United States did not have a history of annexation. Certainly, that's the whole 19th century story that the United States moving westward and acquiring uh, real estate, uh, chunks of real estate after chunks of real estate as, as it moved westward. But this was almost unprecedented in that it would be jumping off the North American continent. And people thought, perhaps that's not quite, we're not quite ready for that. Also, just uh, two years before Grant became president, the United States purchased Alaska at a, at a pretty hefty price, $7.5 million. And many people at the time thought, first of all, the deal was corrupt, and second of all, that it was a waste of money anyway, and uh, known as Seward's icebox and Seward's folly. And so people said, let's, let's not repeat that mistake. Uh, there were charges of corruption related to Santo Domingo. The project was pushed by a couple of businessmen named Joseph Fabens and William Casno, um, who definitely would have made more money had the United States been uh, had accept, uh, annexed uh, Santo Domingo. Um, they were developers, as it were. And, uh, but as Mark Twain's book, um, Mark Twain, uh, uh, The Gilded Age, uh, remi reminds us, uh, businessmen of that type were uh, often uh, referred to as, as corrupt. Even, even uh, they were just dismissed as, as corrupt. So uh, this was... This was working against the, uh, the uh, uh, project as well. The fact that Orville Babcock was involved in the, uh, in the project. He went down and investigated Santo Domingo and then negotiated the treaty for the annexation. And he worked closely with Fabens and Casno. Uh, and this, this was, of course, used against him, uh, against the project. As, again, this is all some kind of corrupt conspiracy uh, to... Uh, uh, to uh, uh, work a deal. Racism was involved in the question as well. Um, many people felt, well, you know, we already have a, a very serious racial problem in the United States in the South. Do we want to take on another area that is predominant, predominantly black and try to deal with that in addition, um, uh, a black mixed race, race population? Even the champion of African-American rights, uh, Charles Sumner, exhibited a kind of uh, racism in his opposition. Uh, Sumner said that the blacks were ideally suited, the tropics were ideally suited for blacks. Uh, the United States ought not to interfere, uh, let them run their own affairs in their own natural habitat. Uh, uh, really quite a racist kind of uh, argument that he would make. Um, not in the sense of overt racism that he hated blacks, but uh, just the, his perception of the differences in the races. The uh, treaty was defeated uh, in June of 1870, 28 to 28 in the Senate. Um, Grant eventually stopped pushing annexation, uh, but he never, he never gave up the idea. He never admitted that it was the wrong thing. Even in his memoirs, where he talks almost exclusively about his military career, he did say one of the few things he mentioned about his presidency was uh, his project for, for Santo Domingo, and he thought that uh, it was the right thing to do. And again, he instanced this uh, question of, of helping uh, Southern blacks by um, acquiring Santo Domingo. There were achievements in other areas, in the economy, reduction of taxation, tariff taxes were lowered, internal taxes were lowered, the income tax was abolished, the inheritance tax was abolished, the national debt was lowered by 17%. Uh, Resumption Act was passed, which scheduled a date for when the United States would pay gold and silver for uh, the, um, the greenbacks. The United States achieved a favorable balance of trade during Grant's term. It also, the government ran uh, eight years of surpluses, no deficits during Grant's term in office. It, was, it wasn't all roses. You had the Panic of 1873, which was a classic banker's panic. The um, uh, leading to a very serious depression. Well, we have to remember, of course, that there was no Federal Reserve at that time uh, to counteract the, the effects of a depression, and so the, the economy spiraled downward. Grant actually toyed with the idea of public works spending. The way to help generate some jobs is to, is to spend federal monies to get people back to work. This was 
a horrible idea to the orthodox thinkers within his own party and most economists of his day. Uh, it was a stimulus package, and, and that kind of thing was simply unacceptable uh, in his time. James A. Garfield, who was head of the House Appropriations Committee, was, was shocked by this, uh, this notion, and Grant did back off it uh, and took the more orthodox point of view. Um, but in his heart, I think he knew what was needed. It was kind of a Keynesian before Keynes, if you will. In the spring of 74, to counteract the Depression, the uh, Congress passed what was called the Inflation Bill, which would have pumped about uh, $90 million of currency back into the economy. And Grant very seriously considered signing that bill. But again, the orthodox thinker said, oh, no, that will destroy business confidence if you flood the economy with too much money. And, and he did eventually veto uh, that bill. And, uh, the inflation bill veto did, did contribute, in a sense, to committing the Republican Party to very orthodox thinking on, on monetary policy. In civil service reform, Grant became a civil service reformer, at least for a while. Uh, in December of 1870, he called for, for reform. Congress authorized a commission to be established to um, uh, write rules for merit appointments and, and so forth in the, in the uh, in the federal bureaucracy. Uh, Grant appointed the, the premier civil service reformer to head that commission, George William Curtis, and uh, it, it went into operation in 1872. There was strong opposition in the Congress, however, because that was a direct assault on uh, the patronage system, on, on the machine uh, that uh, senators and congressmen had built up through uh, the ability to recommend people to office. And, the Civil Service Commission needed appropriations to operate. Year after year, they would, they would ask for an appropriation. Grant would ask for an appropriation for them. And year after year, it got less and less until finally it was cut off altogether and Grant uh, gave up the, experience, uh, the experiment. In the American Indian, once again, Grant had, had great sympathy for the American Indians. And uh, one of the things he wanted to do was to improve their lot as president um, and he inaugurated the so-called peace policy, uh, wanted to clean up the Indian bureaus, get rid of the, the political appointees as agents, Indian agents, who were really the, 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 uh, the front-line people uh, out in the West uh, representing the federal government's policy. And he turned to religious organizations to recommend people to serve in those, those, uh, federal, gov those federal Indian agencies out in the West. Um, but... Although this is a, a, a great humanitarian notion uh, and, and uh, approach to the Indian policy, it still had a fundamental flaw, and that was that its primary aim was to change the Indians' culture. Uh, Grant hoped that someday all the Indians in the West would become self-sustaining farmers, and, and then they would be eligible to vote, and they would be just like white people. Um, and the Indians resisted that kind of change. And uh, generals like Sherman and Sheridan thought, no, um, probably extermination is, is the best policy. And during the latter part of Grant's administration, incidents set off warfare once again. And although he continued to keep the, the religious agents in place, uh, there was warfare once again uh, out west uh, during the latter part of his administration. So overall, I think it's a mixed record. Uh, uh, a mixed record of achievement. Um, but we could ask also one other question uh, today, and that is, what kind of impact did Grant have on the office of president itself? What lessons did he leave for future presidents, whether or not they paid any attention to them? First, he was a great improvement over Andrew Johnson. He began the process of rehabilitating the presidency uh, after Johnson's term in the White House. He established amicable relationships with Congress, even though he had some bitter enemies like Charles Sumner. Generally speaking, he was able to, to treat the Republican Party in Congress as he had treated uh, the army during the war and uh, exercise some effective legislative leadership. Uh, he, he, be, he began to realize pretty soon on that for a president to be effective, he had to be uh, a party leader as well. He himself said uh, that uh, it was folly, uh, it was a utopian idea to run a government without a party. So, th so that, I think, was a significant uh, notion that he brought to the presidency. 
He also made a very important contribution in organizing White House operations. He created a professional staff in the White House, a device for helping him bear the ever-increasing burden uh, of the executive branch. Um, previous presidents had had staff around them, just private secretaries, one or two, who helped them with correspondence. But Grant took the step of drawing upon his wartime experience to create, uh, to, to give his staff actual substantive responsibility. And this did mirror his staff in the, in the Army. Um, in fact, some of the same people uh, served him in the White House, Horace Porter and, and Babcock again and, and Adam Badeau. They, they retained their Army uh, slots, but they were detailed to the White House, didn't even cost the government any extra money, uh, but uh, they, uh, they were there to serve their chief again. So with this kind of staff assistance, Grant the range of issues that he could deal with effectively. Uh, he, he sort of gave him extra sets of eyes and ears, if you will. Um, but others in the government really were, were put off by this. People, some people in Congress, some people in his, in his own cabinet felt that, you know, you have to run, the, run through this, this military clique around the president to get to him. Um, but even, even with that carpeting, set aside, I think we can say that Grant had taken an important step in strengthening the office of president um, and in a step toward developing the apparatus that, uh, that made the, uh, the uh, uh, executive branch more effective when we get to the modern presidency. Um, the, the staff also, I think, helped Grant in his relationships with, with the cabinet. Um, so that uh, some, some people in the cabinet had this notion that they were sort of freestanding agents, could do whatever they wanted. Grant didn't brook that. Uh, and um, anybody who thought they could just sort of go off on a tangent by themselves usually found themselves uh, out of a job pretty quickly. Another contribution Grant made was to the mobility of the presidency. And this, this has a lot of modern ring to it as well. He traveled extensively as president turned aside partisan criticism that he was somehow neglecting his duties. He used the railroad, he used the telegraph, his aides traveled with him uh, so that he could keep on top of business. Uh, when he issued the proclamation against the Ku Klux Klan in, in 1871 in South Carolina, he was actually traveling up here in New England at that time. So, so he, uh, uh, this, this again, I think, is an important step in the creation of the modern presidency because what Grant was essentially saying is, the presidential office is wherever the president happens to be. And we take this for granted uh, now. I would also submit, finally, that I think there were a couple of lessons that Grant left uh, perhaps in spite of himself. And that is that uh, you should pick your aides wisely and you should hold them at arm's length. Uh, not all subsequent presidents have learned this, I think. Uh, Orville Babcock has had many successors over the years. Uh, Sherman Adams, Walter Jenkins, uh, Harry Doherty under Harding, Ehrlichman and Haldeman, if you will. Um, the list goes on and on. But, but this is an important lesson. I think you have to be very careful in the people you have very close around you. Another lesson, tell your story, tell it early, and tell it well. Because if you don't, others are going to tell it for you to your, to your disadvantage. Presidents give the impression of success uh, in considerable measure because they control the narrative. I think in a measurement of Grant's effectiveness in the White House was his election, his re-election in 1872. Despite all these criticisms that I've been mentioning that people leveled against him, certain people did, he was basically quite a popular president and a reasonably effective president. And so when he was up for re-election in 1872, yes, you had that liberal Republican split that went off um, and nominated Horace Greeley, and the Democrats were so desperate they nominated Greeley as well. Grant still won the White House by 56% in the popular vote, which, was, which still is a, a very substantial win. Um, I think another measurement of Grant's effectiveness as president was and follow me closely on this, during the second term, about the middle of his, and end, toward the end of his second term, there, were, there was a movement against his running for a third term. And I say that's a measurement of his effectiveness because that movement came about because his enemies thought, 
this guy is so effective and is so popular, he could probably get a second term, uh, excuse me, a third term. And so they began to talk about, oh, you know, the two-term tradition, we don't want to break that. George Washington started it, and so on and so forth. But again, it, it's a way of saying, sort of in a negative kind of way, this man was actually doing a, a, at least a popular job in the White House. And so they invoke this notion that, well, somehow this violates our ancient customs by, um, by uh, uh, putting this man forward for a third term. Remember, the third uh, presidents were not limited to two terms constitutionally at that time. After four years being out of office when Rutherford B. Hayes was there, um, when you got to 1880, there were a number of people who wanted Grant to run again uh, for uh, a third term at that time. And he came very close to winning the, uh, the nomination in 1880, but it did go to um, the dark horse James A. Garfield. And what's significant about that is that a large part of the argument for Grant in 1880 was that he would be a strong man in the White House after what people regarded as the weak Hayes. Some people called him Miss Nancy Jane Hayes. Uh, we need somebody with vigor once again uh, in, the, in the presidential office. So at least in the minds of his supporters in 1880, Grant had established the notion that the president should be a strong uh, voice, that he should be an activist leader at the center of the national government. We take this for granted today, but if you look at the long evolution of the presidency versus the Congress, uh, this is a milestone, I think, in that um, more and more we're going to see presidents being assertive, and that's what Grant was really up to uh, during his presidency, that the president, uh, these people who voted for him at the convention in 1880 were saying, should not be a mere handmaiden to the Congress. That, I submit, is another step in the creation of the modern presidency, uh, that this was the appropriate role uh, for a president to make. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Please. Just a quick question on the Santo Domingo. Yes. Um, uh, you briefed us on Grant's actions um, for the annexation and that it was defeated. Um, but in his annual address to Congress in, in uh, 1871, he, or excuse me, 1870, he uh, pushed again. He asked Congress to authorize another commission to go to the Dominican Republic and, and uh, look into the annexation issue. So my understanding is a commission went down there, and in the spring of 71, they came back and said they favorably uh, made a decision that, that for annexation um, that, that we should pursue it. And um, at that point, President Grant took no further action. And do you have any idea why he didn't continue to pursue it? I do, actually. Um, first of all, let's remember that the, the treaty initially failed 28 to 28. And for all the reasons I was cat cataloging earlier, <clears throat> there was a, a good bit of opposition to it. And I think that uh, there was an element in, in that commission in looking for vindication. Not necessarily that he felt, I think part of him said, you know, maybe this would work out. But I think another part said, well, I want it on record that what I proposed was right for the country. And I'm glad you brought up that commission because this was, this was a group, this wasn't some sort of, um, you know, cronyism in, in selecting this group. Uh, he selected some, some very um, well-respected leaders in the country to make this trip. Uh, Andrew White, the president of Cornell University, was one of them. Uh, Benjamin Wade, a former senator. These, these were, um, in fact, one of Charles Sumner's most ardent supporters from Massachusetts was the third commissioner. They went down and, and did the kind of thorough examination that Orville Babcock, quite frankly, did not do on his first trip to Santo Domingo. And they came back with, with a glowing report. But what you had between you know, the defeat of the treaty, well, between Babcock's trip and, and the commission's report was all of this political uh, brouhaha over Santo Domingo for, for some of the reasons I was talking about. And I think Grant recognized, all right, this is not going to go through. This, this, is, this is an act of, of just being realistic on his part. And, and as I was indicating, um, in his heart of hearts, he thought, the, the United States has made a big mistake here in this. And uh, uh, he had done everything that he could. What he, what he did when he 
in that, uh, I think it was May of 1871, when he sent the commission report to Congress, he said, oh, all right, here it is. It's up to you now if you want to do something about it. It's up to the American people if they want this. I've, I've done everything I can on behalf of a project I think is good for the country, but um, uh, circumstances, and he didn't, he didn't have to name names at that point, uh, circumstances have, have uh, decided otherwise. As I said, he, he sort of gave up on pushing it after that, although in his last annual message to Congress uh, in December of 1876, he brought it up one more time saying, well, you know, we missed an opportunity. And, and on his deathbed, writing the memoirs, uh, he, he very briefly mentioned it as well. It's a good question, yeah. Anyone else? Please. Uh, yes. Uh, do you think that was developed when he was um, the general in the wars, and that he learned that his lieutenants would be loyal and do whatever he needed them to do, and that just kind of carried over in his whole history, and he believed they'd make mistakes, they were mistakes and not maybe devious, corrupt kind of decisions? Uh, yeah, I do. I do, think, I do think that he did bring to the White House that uh, sense of loyalty that was developed during the war, and I, you know, I, I think that's part of service in war. You're loyal to one another. You, you stand with one another under all kinds of circumstances. And um, there were people that, that Grant didn't get along with, particularly in the war, and who he felt were not doing the job. And, and indeed, they found themselves relieved of command occasionally. And uh, uh, the same was true when he was in the White House. But, but it, there's, I don't think there's any question, really, that... that um, the wartime experience fed that deeply. And with a man like Orville Babcock, who probably was, was the most grievous personal traitor to Grant on that whole loyalty question, um, he had been with Grant through most of the war. I guess he joined the staff in 63, 64, something like that, and had worked closely with him, had, had run errands for him of all kinds, had, um, when... Uh, when Congress passed the Reconstruction Act in 1867, uh, it, the South was to be divided into five districts, five military districts, and the president was supposed to determine what those districts were. And Johnson said, well, you know, since these are military districts, perhaps you should tell me who the commanders of those districts should be. And uh, Grant said, took, took, turned to Adam Badeau and, and Horace Babcock, said, you, you guys work this out and let me know. Uh, he could delegate to these people because he felt they had served him well. Uh, and uh, uh, a man like Babcock, who's very high ranking in his class at West Point, uh, somehow had a, had a makeup that made him less than worthy of that loyalty. But I don't think there's any question that, that the patterns of behavior, the patterns of relationship with subordinates that Grant uh, developed during the war certainly stuck with him uh, in the uh, in the uh, White House. Well, we have to remember about this man, Grant. He went into the Civil War at age 38, and his life, I'm sure you've discussed this already in the course, had not been terribly successful before. And so he was in a set of circumstances where he was achieving success, and forging those kinds of relationships that you're talking about uh, was part of achieving that success. And he felt, I think, at least implicitly, that the same kind of thing could work to his advantage in the, uh, in the White House. Harry Truman used to say, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. Uh, and the point was that the way things worked in the Capitol, still today, probably, uh, most likely, uh, was that you, have to, you have to be careful. That's what I said about that, choose your age carefully, choose them wisely, because uh, you never know who may, who may not be uh, worthy of, of the choice that you've made. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Please. Yes, sir. So over, as you read his memoirs and some of the other books as we've discussed in class, you kind of get this feeling that Grant was somewhat of a kind of a hesitant leader. You know, he never was one to kind of, you know, raise his hand and say, hey, I want to be the general of this. I want to command this. He, he kind of let his actions speak for himself. And even as he writes about, you know, how he came to become the, the nominee for president, it was almost like he, he backed his way into it. And it was kind of like, well... You know, he felt like he had to do it because, you know, nobody else would fight for what was gained during the war. Do you get a sense that he was a, a, a kind of a reluctant leader, that he was a little more driven uh, towards success in some of these higher positions than maybe it's portrayed in some of these, these, these writings? Uh, 
That's an excellent question. Um, the, 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 the psychological makeup of Ulysses S. Grant is something that has puzzled me for many, many years. And I, there is an element of hesitation in him, but I do think there's also an element of ambition. Um, Grant, you know, we know he didn't like to have councils of war that much. He liked listening to people and, and then sort of coming up with his own decisions and then moving forward on them. But uh, uh, clearly, when the war came on, he was eager to get into it. It wasn't, it wasn't somebody going knocking on his door and saying, you know, hey, you went to West Point. Why don't you go see if you can get in the Army uh, after Fort Sumter? Uh, he, he definitely put himself forward. As we know, he did resign his, his commission during the 1850s, largely for personal reasons, uh, thinking that service out of the far west was just a dreary kind of life away from his beloved family. Um, so when the war came on, he, after a string of uh, personal economic failures, he thought, okay, I'm trained to do this. I'm going to offer my services, and he did. So in that sense, uh, he, w he was eager to do his part, and... Um, uh, I think that, uh, again, when he had those initial successes, I think you, in his memoirs you may remember his saying that his, his first significant battle, I mean, it wasn't a huge battle, but it was one in which he discovered that, hey, the enemy's as afraid of, of me as I am of him. Uh, and this was, this was the light bulb going off. This is, this is important. And it, and it taught him that he could actually accomplish things and, and, and um, uh, that he had the wherewithal to to do something of importance. And, and I think he, he drove himself as general uh, after that to, to succeed and, 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 and did. As far as accepting the nomination for president is concerned, I think there definitely was an element of hesitation in that. As I said, he had been in Washington for four years. He had seen this horrible wrangling between the president and the Congress and could say to him, and he had served briefly as Secretary of War and saw, sat at those cabinet meetings and saw some really kind of awful performances. Do I want to really be involved in that? Um, but on the other hand, um, I think there was a kernel of ambition within him. And um, as you point out, he also believed, you know, I may be the only one who can actually secure the results of the war. We've got these politicians wrangling with one another. I, I may be the only one. Uh, I'm a national figure. Uh, for, for whatever reason, I'm there. And, and uh, uh, maybe I can, I can sort of bring some sense into people's minds. Um, when, when Grant became president, with, within a year, uh, he sat down with his secretary of state one time, Hamilton Fish, who kept a wonderful diary, and, and said, you know, this is after he'd gone and undergone a lot of criticism and so forth, and said, um, you know, I don't know what it is about this job that people want. Uh, if, if it weren't for my sense of duty, I would resign. I would resign the presidency. I think it was June 1870 he said that. And, and uh, uh, there were times when he said, you know, the president was paid $25,000 a year. The general in chief of the United States at that time was paid $17,000 a year. These were very large salaries. And $17,000, I mean, that was easy street. It was a lifetime job. It's, I gave that up. I gave that up. And here I am in this, in this uh, cauldron, this... this this storm of uh, criticism all the time. Why should I do this? And, and he did feel that he had something uh, to contribute to the country. And um, when he was reelected and he took the oath of office for the second time, uh, you could see the pain in the sense that he felt because he did, he did say, um, I, I take the result of the election as something of a vindication for what I've tried to do. And uh, uh, it, did, it didn't shut up his enemies particularly, but, but uh, uh, he could at least say, uh, it looks as if the American people have something, uh, have a different sort of uh, idea about what I'm up to. Good question. Other? Yes, please. President Tomás Alberto Cortez from Mexican Navy. Yes. Uh, my question is concerned about the political perspective of Grant's administration. Uh, is there any historical record that could give us any information about what was the relationship and uh, uh, of the view of Grant's administration toward Mexico in, the, in that time? I know that in that time he was so concerned inside, the political was inside because of the reconstruction, but is there any information about that relationship? Uh, relations with Mexico, they were, they were, of course, generally peaceful, but you remember, of course, that there... there there was the uh, 
the uh, attempt to establish an empire in Mexico, the yes. Maximilian and so forth, and who was assassinated. And, and before Grant became president, there was, there was thought, and he uh, engaged in this thought, that perhaps the United States should invade Mexico uh, and, and throw out Maximilian and so forth. And, and uh, uh, so uh, he, was, he was very interested in maintaining amicable relations with Mexico um, and he, he was quite close to the um, Mexican uh, ambassador, then it was called minister, in Washington, Matthias Romero. And uh, uh, I think those two men working together did keep the relationship between the two countries fairly strong. You're quite right in pointing out that, that Grant's attention was primarily uh, focused elsewhere. And um, there, there was no... There was no sense at that time of, of a, shall we say, an activist foreign policy with, with the State Department having all these separate desks, you know, what's going to, what, how are we going to treat Central America? How are we going to keep, treat Europe? It was almost as if uh, the United States and its foreign affairs uh, operated on an ad hoc basis. And when crises came up, like the Alabama claims, you dealt with them. Um, the United States actually paid a lot more attention to Cuba at the time because of the Cubans' attempt to uh, overthrow Spanish rule there. Grant uh, may, have been wanting, may have wanted to uh, help out militarily. I don't think he really did, but, but he certainly uh, was sympathetic to the Cuban insurgents. And, and within the administration, he thought strongly about perhaps recognizing their belliger belligerency, which would have been a, a boost to their efforts to overthrow the, uh, the Spanish uh, from control there. But that, that was ta entangled with the Alabama claims, incidentally, because the Alabama claims, part of the problem was that we thought that Great Britain recognized the belligerency of the Confederacy much too early and perhaps never should have done so. And so we couldn't really turn around and say, oh, by the way, we think the Cuban insurgents are real belligerents and they deserve all the rights that belligerents uh, should have during time of war, particularly in relationship with neutrals. So um, that was occupying him much more uh, than, than relations with Mexico. He and, he and Romero did sort of um, develop a strong personal tie that, that managed to keep things uh, reasonably uh, peaceful. I mean, definitely peaceful. Sure. Anyone else? Sir, please. Uh, so I had a question about uh, Grant's relationship with Sherman after the war. Um, Sherman continuing on as chief of the army and later on, but this uh, notion of Grant and uh, his ties with um, army colleagues, with uh, this brotherhood that established. I mean, in his memoirs, he speaks so highly of Sherman as a friend and colleague and trusted subordinate. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on their relationship after the after the war, uh, personal relationship, and especially since the fact that Sherman advised Grant not to run, not to to enter politics at all, and uh, and then we know Sherman's own view of presidential politics. Uh, could you shed some light on that and how it affected Grant at all, or what counsel Sherman may have given him? It's a good question. Uh, yeah, Sherman, of course, was was completely. I shouldn't say apolitical. He was anti-political. He, he hated the whole game of politics and didn't want to get involved. And he thought, I think he may have thought to Grant, you know, this, you're unsuited for this. This is, this is really not what you were cut out to do. And, uh, you know, some would argue that perhaps there was an element of truth in that. Sherman's own brother was a politician, Senator John Sherman, and quite a successful one, an aspirate for the presidency. Never made it, of course, but but uh, he certainly didn't uh, hold back from trying uh, to get the Republican nomination. Um, so there was, there was a sense that, uh, I think there was an element of tension then between Sherman and Grant because of that, that, uh, that uh, Sherman may have thought that Grant uh, made some mistakes in, uh, in, um, in becoming president, made a mistake, and also that, that um, particularly in the Western policy, the, the Indian policy. I think Sherman was much more sympathetic to Sheridan's ideas of just, you know, trouncing these people, uh, exterminating the Indians if necessary. Grant, much more sympathetic to, to the Indians, trying to protect them. Uh, Grant very early on said the problem in the West is, is 
the encroachment by the white settlers. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is to somehow work out the relationship between the newcomers to the region and the, the longtime occupants there. But Sherman was, was more sympathetic toward Sheridan's approach of, of warfare to deal with the problem in the West. And so um, I think there, there were some questions about uh, how much independence Grant let Sherman have as general in the chief. I think they had a little bit of difficulty working out that relationship as to uh, what Sh Sh Sherman would be able to do on his own and what he would need to check with the Secretary of War, for instance, what he would need to check with the White House. But, uh, but um, I, I do think there's an element of disappointment on Sherman's part that, that Grant did go the political route, something that, that he refused uh, himself. And, um, and made that famous statement. Uh, he, he's often thought of Sherman as saying that statement in 1884, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. He actually made it as early, I think it was 1871, when people were thinking about running him to try to defeat Grant. And, and he certainly said, no, there's no way I want to get involved in politics. And, and uh, I don't think it was an animosity that developed by any means but I think it's an element of disappointment on the part of a friend when you see a friend perhaps doing something you think that that friend is not particularly suited for. Who else? Okay. All right, thank you very much. Join us each Saturday.